the Unleash Success Podcast, where we break down the secrets of success to give you real tools and strategies that get real results. And now, here's your host, Corey Corpodian. This is Corey Corpodian. Welcome back to Unleash Success. If you guys haven't subscribed to our newsletter yet, be sure to go to UnleashSuccess.com and just enter your email so you can get all the tools and strategies sent directly to you each and every week. Today, we have an exciting show where we get not one, but two guests. We have Thomas Fiss and Jonathan Brown, who are the founders of Partnerly, a company whose mission is to simplify artist and musician partnerships so that they can pair with music-based marketing to maximize brands' exposure and their revenue. They've worked with a few companies that you guys might have heard of, such as American Airlines, Salesforce, Amazon, Forever 21, and Billabong, just to name a few. And today, they're going to walk us through their entrepreneurial journey and how they built this amazing business over the last three years. Thomas and Jonathan, thanks so much for coming on the show. Glad to be here. Absolutely, man. Glad to be here. Awesome. So I would love to hear how you guys got into this partnership program with brand building and these huge companies, where your journey in music really started for each one of you. Yeah, we we have an interesting story. I mean, we came from the, the music industry. Um, John was a, a producer and still is a producer, very active in, uh, in writing and producing music for several artists that I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, and then I, w- I was an artist on Capitol for a number of years. And it was, you know, it was this situation where we kept running into, um, you know, how do we, how do we help artists make money outside of streaming? Because it was just going downhill. And uh, we decided that brand partnerships seemed to be, um, you know, a way that, that artists hadn't really connected with, um, you know, as far as generating revenue. So we took a stab at it. Um, and, uh, you know, three years later, here we are, um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're still innovating and still doing our best to really help music companies understand that this is a real thing and that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of revenue to be, ha- to be had out there. Um, and on the same side, you know, a lot of brands are still just trying to figure out what they can do with, with, you know, we'll call them a music influencer, um, because a lot, there's a lot you can do with, with an artist that you can't do with a traditional influencer. So, you know, part of our, our mission is really to help educate um, and and really innovate. So that's where we are. And Jonathan? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you summed it up right there. Other than that, it's just really been an exciting time to see the progression of this. In the beginning stages, we were a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, and slowly, as a lot of these platforms have been taking off of, uh, like Instagram with brand partnerships and advertisements and everything, been really nice to position ourselves in that space where we're still a little bit ahead of the curve. Absolutely. So you guys are, we're both in the music industry, Jonathan, you were a producer, Thomas, you were an artist. Mm -hmm. And what made you switch into building your own company and jumping into entrepreneurship? Yeah. Um, I, I, I got burned, man. I mean, I think that's the best way to put it is I was, I was in a position where I had, you know, I had the whole world in front of me. Um, and there were a couple brand deals that were out on the table and, um, you know, they, they weren't as successful as I would have hoped them to be. Um, and really a lot of that just came down to me just being the artist and thinking that, you know, there was someone there that was going to take care of it for me. Um, and that was my first real spark to where I kind of had a moment where, like, hmm, you know, there's, there's gotta be a better way to, to manage these types of, of situations. Um, so I dabbled in, in brand partnerships for, for a couple of years after that and, um, tagged in with John and, and, you know, the rest is history from there. Nice. And, and Jonathan, why did you go for, you still do music producing, but why did you end up doing this? It was a similar situation where I was, uh, working as a writer producer for many years with some of the biggest labels. And, um, I think I, I, I was getting tired and burnt out of the, of the, of the constant sessions, um, without having, um, a little bit of a bigger picture to work towards that, um, that I think, you know, because of the, the situation with streaming taking over and I saw that, you know, there's an untapped market here with, with the marketing and brand partnership side. And 
something that was a little bit less less sexy than a regular record deal, if you know what I mean. But I think that I was at a point in my life where I was ready to to really just try to help solve problems rather than be, um, you know, waiting for a, a major corporation to to turn around and and, and say yeah, solve problems for me. So that was that was my big motivation. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, I just, you know, growing up in internet age, streaming, you know, da- free downloading or right. yeah, I guess illegally downloading music, it's just kind of part of like an everyday thing. It doesn't seem like a big deal. And and less, I don't even know if they have CD stores anymore. I'm always shocked when yeah. I see like anybody selling CDs yeah. and DVDs. What? <laughs> um, and so how to maximize profit for some of these artists, which, so you guys basically build the relationship with the brand. How does it work? How do you capture these huge brands like American Airlines and Salesforce? How do you guys get involved with them? And then how do you help a musician or artist engage with them? Yeah, I think, you know, for the, from the brand perspective, a lot of brands are, are, you know, they're really hip to it, right? They're, they have incredible marketing teams. A lot of them have their own agencies that they outsource to that are, you know, um, the best in the business. I think what it comes down to is disruption and really just staying ahead of the curve. And so a lot of these companies are always looking for the next, next best thing. I think influencer marketing has become so popular now and so embedded in, in a lot of uh, marketing budgets that um, it's easy for them to, to adopt, you know, why they should work with a a music artist. Um, So from the brand side, it's been, it's been um, a fairly simple process. Um, as far as onboarding them, what, what, what gets interesting and what gets kind of fun from our perspective is really educating them again on, you know, what, what the value is with an artist. And, you know, is that having a live stream in a recording studio? Is that some type of surprise and delight experience? Um, is that a backstage experience at a show? You know, there's so many different things that, that a brand can do that, um, okay. oh, sorry, I've talked in the background. <laughs> No, I think, it's, I think it's, it's just edu- the educational process of really showing them, well, okay, great. I'm glad that, glad that you, as a brand, have done influencer partnerships, but what was that process? Like, how did you come to those decisions? Like, how did you decide that you want such and such of an emer- emerging artist and, and really just doing a deep dive into that process and, and, and nine times out of 10, a brand will say, A, they have a personal relationship with an artist or that, you know, so-and-so said they should, or maybe they're charting, but that doesn't always necessarily mean that'll translate into the best partnership for the brand. So, okay. So what are some artists that you guys work with? And specifically, you know, if, if it's not like, you know, Beyonce or something, how do you really captivate and um, let brands know the ROI on this musician as an influencer? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. The, the ROI is based upon what the brand's goals are, you know? So um, it's really making sure that we're aware of what, what they're looking for the results to be, and then using that as a way to f- discover the artist. So, um, you know, there are artists that may have hyper local focus, like in, let's say, Miami, and they're really trying to boost their visibility in, in a certain area, or they may be really wanting to beef up their social media. So depending on what their, what their goals are, that's how we kind of backpedal into choosing the right artists. And interestingly enough, like some of these emerging artists have a much better result of, because of their engagement level than some of the Beyonce's of the world. And uh, that's what, we're, you know, since we come from the artist side of things, we're very pro that make, that's what really makes us pro emerging artists. Um, because there's been a lot of studies that have been done that say like, look, you know, if you go and spend that million dollars with a top artist, that's good. But like, you may not actually get the same results as if you spent a little bit less money than that, say 250,000 or, and, and, and engaged five or 10 emerging artists that really hit this the exact demographic that your, that your brand is representing. Very interesting. A lot of that comes down to just the, the emerging artists just being a little bit more hungry and, and willing to do a little bit more and go the extra mile. Whereas, you know, the, the A-list artists, the Bruno Marses of the world, you know, they, 
they certainly have an impact and they certainly play a role in this, in this, you know, marketing world. But um, those emerging artists are really, they're incredible to work with. They're always willing to do a lot more than what's asked of them and required. So um, it's a lot of fun. You can really have a lot of fun with the concepts as well. Like they get, they get really involved and, and like to throw their own two cents in, into the mix. And um, what that does is that establishes a long-term relationship with a brand um, to where they, they become more of a, you know, a long-term ambassador. Whereas, you know, that initial relationship started off with just, you know, Hey, just post a, post a quick Facebook post and that'll, that'll be it. And then, you know, that segues into a multi-year deal. So it's, it's really interesting to see. I was wondering if you guys could walk us through, um, kind of the process from, you know, start to finish of how, you know, maybe one of these, um, projects you've worked with, with like Billabong or, you know, American airlines, one of those that you guys did, what, what did you provide for them? And then, um, what was kind of the end result for the brand or for the, uh, the company and for the artists? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the more interesting ones is, is a, a project we did with forever 21 that, um, really is what, you know, what we were saying before really turned into a larger thing. Um, so originally it started off as just being a, a partnership with, um, an artist on Warner brothers that we would call like a B level artist. Um, and it, it, from, from the brand's perspective, you know, they were looking for just a quick live performance in a, in a store. They weren't looking for too much. Um, they just wanted something fun and experiential, a quick little pop-up show. But again, what it turned into is a much larger thing. There was a, a social media takeovers uh, turned into more of a week long process. Um, the win on both sides is interesting because the brand didn't, didn't, there was no money exchange to, to the artist. Hmm. Um, but the labels understood the value of the marketing, the, the marketing value behind that and promoting the artist in the long term, and, you know, sharing audiences and uh, all that fun stuff. So, you know, when we talk about these large brands that have a lot of cash to throw around, sometimes it's the, it's the brands that, you know, it's just, it's really a true partnership and it's more of a trade deal. And, you know, the currency isn't necessarily cash, but it's certainly marketing value. Yeah. So exposure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who was the artist? If you can share. Um, it's an artist called lights and they, are they still working with forever 21 then as part of this deal? I don't, I don't know if they, I don't know if they are. I know that they were working with, they were working with her for, um, a couple months afterwards trying to figure out getting vinyl into the stores. I'm not sure if that ever oh. came into fruition, but you know, that's another example of, of us kind of teeing up that, that relationship and then backing off and letting the two parties kind of, um, you know, figure out whatever they want to do in the future. Right. Because you're the platform to connect the two and then they eventually make their own deal. Absolutely, man. That's awesome. Um, and so where do you guys find this, uh, database of musicians? Well, I mean, we've both been in the industry for quite a while, so it has really helped us forge relationships with every single record label. Um, and, um, you know, we do outreach to indies, um, ones that we, I think the difference between us is that we, we curate our, our platform rather than a lot of our other competitors that, um, just sort of open the, uh, open the gates to, to everybody. Um, so that gives us a little bit more of exclusivity. And, and I think it's, it's been helpful and it's been attractive to, to artists to want to join because they're put alongside of, you know, the biggest labels out there. So and management companies. So yeah, it's been, it's been really, it's been really uh, not as complicated as we, as we thought it was going to be. Well, that's the first time in business I've ever heard that. Right. That <laughs> one. We're like, okay, we're fine. <laughs> so, you know, just talking about kind of uh, stumbling along the way as mm -hmm. you grow a business, we all have growing pains. Um, what are some of the failures maybe you guys have encountered what did you learn from it and how do you end up overcoming it? Oh boy, that's a great question. I think, I think failures is, is interesting. It's um, what, what's unique about what I'll say is unique about John and myself is that, you know, throughout the, the two years that we've been business partners and, and working on this together, there's always been just like with any endeavor, there's always been plenty of speed bumps, and plenty of roadblocks. And, you know, with us though, it's, it's always been an opportunity to find a solution and 
you know, the platform really came because of uh, us running into a roadblock. We were operating as a manual agency, just like the thousands of other agencies that are out there. And we were trying to find a value proposition to offer, um, offer brands and why they should work with us other than, you know, some of the largest ones in the world. And that was an example of us kind of having an, you know, another aha moment of, well, let's just, instead of trying to barrel through this wall, why don't we just go around it? (laughs) And um, so, you know, blessing in disguise, but I think, you know, in the entrepreneurship world, there's always those moments where you're going to hit those, those roadblocks and it's important to figure out a way around it. Um, I think you're going to exhaust yourself if you try and just beat your head and go straight through, you have to be a little bit more clever and unique and disruptive. And um, if you can, take the time to really sit with, with that problem. Um, I think you're going to, you're going to find a solution to it. Yeah, no, that's absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, some of the best business ideas come out of solving a problem a lot of times and usually something, a problem that we have in our own life. Right. Um, and partnering together, you know, Jonathan, you mentioned this earlier that you guys are in, you guys actually work remotely a lot of times, um, which is pretty cool. You know, it's, very different than the typical job where, you know, you've got to meet in person. And I feel like if I ever, when I used to have all these meetings um, and people I talk to have meetings all the time, like what a waste of 60 minutes, send me an email. (laughs) Like, so what is it like working remotely and how do you guys, um, how'd you guys pick each other as partners as well too? You know, what's the partnership like? I'll start with the first part. Working remotely, I got to tell you, it is the most productive. I think we've, it's, it's, it's insane. Um, you know, we will do, uh, we'll be on Google Hangouts. I think we're Google Hang- Hangouts best client, to be honest with you, because we are on that nonstop every day. Nice. But it's incredibly productive. Um, we can tag team um, any project, uh, any concepts. We have remote teams in San Francisco and a few others that just float around as well. So, you know, we do weekly calls and check-ins. Um, the other, the other component to what you brought up about the the meetings and that being a waste of time, we actually made it a, a company policy to not do those. Um, nice phone, <laughs> phone calls only, if absolutely necessary. Uh, email and text because it's quick and it's efficient and it gets right to the point. Kind of cuts out the bullshit. Um, I think too many times a lot of these. Several people, even at high up, you know, we're talking C-level executives get caught up in the, in the, Hey, let's go grab a coffee game. And it's a, it's a waste of time. And we just, at this point, we're moving fast and we just, uh, not to say that we're better than that, but we're, we're trying to, to act that way. Um, to evolve, right? Absolutely. I, I, I'm, it blows me away and I still work in offices. You guys know I'm an orthodontist as well, part time. And so, yep. um, you know, just beautiful, the beautiful teeth, by the way. What's that? Yeah, I gotta come to you. Yeah, oh, there we go. We'll sit. We'll get with some invisible. I got that. Um, so it's just you know, I used to drive three hours a day when I first started. Uh, I was working down in San Diego, and it was such a waste of time. You know, eventually I found Audible, so I started learning in that time. But you know, just driving mm-hmm. to work, and then now when you know I'm not working in an orthodontic office, but I have you know somebody for marketing where we go for a meeting, and I think about how much time we spend just driving to that meeting, yeah. and then at the meeting, kind mm-hmm. of like the small talk, hey, you know, how's it going? How are you doing? And it's important to build mm-hmm. those relationships, but. Sometimes it's like, how much actual work did we get done? 100%. 100%. And, and, you know, the relationship building component is, is it's vital, of course, but, you know, we, we took the stance of, uh, we let our, our work and our product speak for itself. And so you're either, you're either interested in just forming a professional relationship, um, and, and us really collaborating or, or you're not because, there's there's not really any need for us to to give you a song and dance we put all of our cards on the table and uh there's not really too much more to be said other than that so and it's it's worked it's worked great to our advantage i think a lot of companies respect that um we've turned down coffee meetings with uh some people that most people wouldn't turn down ever and it's turned into an immediate follow-up saying great let's just do business so um it's it's a it's a policy that that we're kind of keeping in place and and we'll continue that as is as long as it kind of works in our favor. Yeah. I mean, very interesting, very different, yep. you know, talk about innovation and you yeah. guys are definitely doing it differently, but it sounds like it's getting you results. That's yep. all that matters, right? Yep. Absolutely. 
And so yeah. I'd love to hear about how you guys formed your own partnership and how that's working out for you as far as, you know, you know, you guys complement each other well and, and what happened when you started and where you've grown over the last three years. Yeah, I think like, you know, Thomas and I met each other on the creative side of the music industry. And um, in the early stages, it was it was just more on that side and informing that relationship, that personal relationship. And then from there, I think um, we both were just genuinely interested in the space and having like regular conversations. It didn't come from a, you know, meetup.com or anything like that. And it was just, just two dudes that were genuinely interested in innovation and trying to figure out this mess. Cause we were, we were of, of like brand partnerships in the music side and, and because we were both living it. So I think one day over coffee, we were, we were just, we were just chatting and we're like, why don't we try to start something together? Because we keep circling back to this point. It was just, and then, and, and I came from a, a, a position of like, you know, uh, my, both my, both my parents were, are, are entrepreneurs and it was very, uh, much, taught to me that it's it's tough to take on partners so I, I i had that kind of in my background but i i knew that the difference is in this situation is it's too big of a problem to just kind of put bear all the weight and I, and I think like you know thomas said just an extraordinary like background that it was just it was just like let's see what it was really just saying like let's see how far we can go what what can, what can we do with this so that was that was the um the experience. And how do you guys stay focused and motivated as you've been kind of really solving this problem? It sounds like, I mean, you're doing it manually for the first couple of years and you finally launched your platform, which will kind of automate things. But how do you stay focused to get to this point right here? We're crazy. <laughs> We're nuts. <laughs> I think it's really it even coming down to your um, comment before, which is efficiency. I think efficiency is just the only way It's the only way you can possibly do this with, with, you know, the limited resources and the, and, and from the ground up starting it as a seed is like, you have to value time almost more than, than money in a way. And that I think is really something that a lot of people going back to what you said, it's just like, you know, people say like, well, did you, did you catch that TV show? Did you, what did you do this weekend? And it's like, hey, no, I didn't, I didn't, yeah. You know, and it's those types of, and it's, and it's, but it's not coming from a place of like, Oh, I missed that. It's like, once you see something growing, like it just, it, it, it keeps motivating you because you see results. So it's easy to keep the momentum because you know, you see the progress. Totally. I, I was going to say is that like, I, the first time was about two years ago where I actually stopped working so much as an orthodontist because I wanted to pursue my passions. And it was so hard for me to sacrifice. Well, I say sacrifice, but it was just like giving up money. That was easy. All I had to do was show up to work basically to pursue time. But the problem was right. that I actually, you know, started making a lot more money than I'd ever made. And I didn't have time. I didn't have the the ability to spend things like working on this podcast, which now I do, you know, at least once a week and I love and it fuels me and drives me and I can stay up so late. But the ability to have time, free time is so big and to be efficient in that time, um, you know, to your point about watching TV, a bunch of my buddies watch the uh, NFL draft. Like, did you catch that? And I'm like, I love football. You know, I'm in a fantasy league. Uh, I love watching football. Right, right. I miss the whole thing. I'll like read an article about it later because I was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not spending extra four hours or something on that day watching it. Yep. Absolutely. Yes. Can you afford it? Can you afford it? And like, you know, I, I think that there's obviously there's the balance. You need to not go all the way. I think, I think, you know, saying that I, you know, don't do all of that is, is, is ridiculous, but I think it's just, just balancing it out so that you know that you're not, you're not spending all your it's time so on funny. I, stuff when you can't afford, when you can't afford it. That's a, that's because if you're not where you're at, if we're not where you want to be, then 
you know, can you really afford right. that free time? Exactly. Like, I mean, so many people are like, well, I, I don't <laughs> care if you love your life and you're living your dream life, but if you're complaining all the time right. about you're not accomplishing your goals, right. stop complaining, start taking action. Yeah. Um, right. it, that's, that's awesome. Um, I absolutely love that. Uh, so Thomas, uh, what about you? Uh, it, as far as building the part or the partnership between you guys, cause I was, I'm, what I'm hearing right now is you really have to build a team to tackle something so massive. I myself have a lot of people that do basically freelance work for me to basically, uh, things that I'm not as efficient at. I'd rather pay somebody else to do. What's mm-hmm. the process of building your guys' team and how do you find the right, uh, partners? Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to um, it comes down to passion. Uh, it comes down to being able to keep up with John and I. I think we kind of set a really high high bar, which you know, I kind of putting ourselves on a pedestal. But I, you know, I I have yet to see anyone work right. Yeah, no, I, I have yet to see anyone really really put in the hours that we do. I mean, I just like you're an orthodontist during the daytime. I lead brand partnerships for a, a major music festival, so that eats up a, a solid chunk of my day. And then I come home and uh, I plug in and work with John until all hours of the night, get up, do it again. So, and then, you know, our weekends are filled as well, just like, you know, doing this, <laughs> doing a podcast. So, um, yeah. you know, it comes down to passion. It comes down to finding teammates that, that are, um, that enjoy music. I think that's first and foremost, you have to love what you do. Um, and then, you know, talent and skill obviously play a major role in that. But for us, it's really, um, finding people that we can jive with. I think, you know, going back to when we were talking about relationship building, I think it still is important to be, to be comfortable with who you're working with, um, mm-hmm. to have, you know, have a, an easy conversation with someone and, um, be able to collaborate with them is really important. Building, building a team is not easy, uh, especially for something like this because it is so unique. Uh, but we've had a lot of success finding teams, you know, again, found a great development team in San Francisco. Uh, we partnered with a great uh, agency for our on-demand services out in Las Vegas. Uh, we have team members that travel the world. Um, again, we do, we try and schedule weekly check-ins, daily check-ins if necessary for certain projects. So, um, you know, a lot of it just comes down to, to again, time management and uh, so far so good. That's awesome. You know, I was thinking about it in my head a lot of times, um, I missed the draft because I was working. I wasn't paying attention to it. But, you know, I've been trying to catch up on Game of Thrones. And I joke because I'm uh, six seasons behind or whatever. But I figured, (laughs) all right, it's finally time. Um, But I'll work. And what I do is I monotask a lot. You know, people like to multitask. And that just, it's for me, it's horribly inefficient. I like to focus on one thing for a period of time and just knock out as much as I can about it. And then I'll go relax or do whatever. So that way I can move on to the next step. Usually I I chunk a couple hours towards podcasting, a couple hours towards social media marketing, and then a couple hours towards whatever else I'm working on. Um, And then relax. So I find that to be really efficient for me. I don't know, you know, it sounds like you guys working with the team, you really organized. What do you find is some of the tools you use to stay so organized? Oh man, I got some of the best advice from um, uh, uh, the CEO of Dutch Bros and I sat down with him and he gave the best advice because I asked him a very similar question and he came down, he, he basically just flat out said, he was like, you have to be present. So to your point, monotasking is incredible, incredible. Um, it's all about being present and uh, being in that moment. You'll get, you'll burn through your projects a lot, a lot quicker and, um, you know, more, more productivity, more output. Um, and that's kind of something that I've, I've taken to heart. I know John has as well. So that's it, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I definitely find that passion helps me stay a lot more focused. It's easy to have energy to burn when you're passionate about something. Yeah, you get lost. You can get lost in the shuffle real quick if you don't if you don't keep that under control. You'll you'll burn yourself out. Um, you know, you just have to really focus and and make sure that you do have a list and you're and you are checking those boxes because you know there's been times in our early stages. I know John and I just burned up entire days just you know shooting ideas back and forth and. Uh, you know, saying, Oh, wouldn't this be great? And us trying to build something. And then, you know, really that turns, that turns into a time suck and really just, just, you know, burns energy. Um, I think we really hit our, we really hit a good cadence uh, about a year and a half ago. 
And I think we just really focused in and that was really special because since then it's just been, it's been nonstop um, uptick, which is great. Yeah. Uh, something you said there, which actually I feel like I'm hearing a lot more often um, when I talk to people about, you know, sometimes people like to do some side hustles or they're starting to build a business is we can get so caught up in the long-term vision and talking about, you know, how exciting something is without making real actionable strides sure. forward. Um, and so sometimes, you know, it, it becomes a time suck, like you said. And I, I really connect with that because I hear it a lot where people are like, yeah, I've been working on this, but what's the result, right? We yeah. haven't gotten anywhere yet. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. it, it's hard, but it's kind of hard to look at yourself in the mirror and say, all right, you know what? I really actually need to take some real action. And that leads me to one of the things that we always talk about on this show is just the 80-20 rule. Um, and that comes from statistics, but w- way we use it is that 80% of our results come from 20% of our actions. Uh, yep. And just the key is knowing which actions we should take, right? Um, so to recap kind of some of the stuff that you guys have talked about and what some actions you've taken to really help grow your company and your business, um, you know, what's something that somebody else who's kind of in that time suck can do to really step forward? Well, I think what's interesting is that in any, any startup or any emerge, like small business or any new venture, right? There's, there's a lot of the unknown, right? So you're dealing with the fact that, okay, you have your idea of what you think this would be, but then you also have what it will actually be. Right. And so I kind of, deconstruct it sort of like almost like on a grade school level where you're doing a science project and you're like, all right, so I, I love this, right? Let's say you like loved, I don't know, whatever your, whatever your, your passion project is. And that's great to have that passion. But then at the same time, like also couple that with, with the practicality. So you're like, all right, well, um, I love this. I think this will be great. I think I see a need people respond, but then also but running your own tests, running your test saying like, okay, well, out of these 10 things that we just did this week to start this business, like what, what had, what had the results and, and you, know, you don't have to totally write everything down, but just pay attention and be aware of where are you focusing your time? Are you focusing on it just because you're passionate about it? Are they yielding results at some point, even though you're super passionate about a subject, like if you're not getting results, you've got to kind of, really look at that because you're burning time and, you know, see if that aligns with what your goals are. You may have to pivot a little bit and and focus on the things that may not be as, you might not be as passionate about, but I think you can get there and just maybe in a different way. Yeah. It's funny. People think that, you know, um, you've got all this passion, you've got all this energy. And, and for me, um, this right here, interviewing you guys, talking to you guys about this stuff, that gets me <laughs> excited. Yep. What people don't see is that I'll send this off to one of my friends to help make it radio loud, and then he'll send it back to me, and then I'll go through it, and I'll listen to it two or three times, make sure that there's not any like messed up edits, and I spend hours oh. uploading this and, and reproducing the sound and all this all right. that... I have to do that. I'm just kind of like, uh, I just want to go to sleep right now. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm like, I'm excited about it, but, um, sometimes I have to do stuff that I don't really want to do. Yep. Absolutely. All, All the, the time. time. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> All the time. That, like one moment of like, the juice, but, man, you know, the passion of life. But that's the, but that's the, but that's the, like, that's the process, right? You know, like if everything was just, if everything was just so blissful all the time, I don't think that you'd have those moments that are just like, you know, you're, you're in, in your podcast and you're in your, you've gotten that right edit and you're super excited about it. I think it's, you know, it's just appreciating all the stuff. We talked a little bit about this before we jumped on Jonathan. Um, you know, uh, Thomas, uh, I'll share this with you too, is that my, my cousin passed away and, um, and to hear that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that very much. And, um, you know, it was, it was kind of shocking, but it, what I got from it was an interesting moment of clarity about gratitude and really, you know, sometimes I would be upset or tired or frustrated and just, you know, not enjoying the process as much and trying to become something, you know, this vision of success that I had. And, 
you know, it does take hard work and sometimes it's not super fun and passionate. But what I found in the moment of clarity was I, I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to work hard. I'm grateful that I'm in this position to be growing a business, to be growing a brand. And yeah, I think that to your point, Jonathan, that the contrast, you know, it's not that I'm living blissfully necessarily every moment, but if I take a moment to really appreciate where I'm in and at in the process, um, it makes it a little bit easier. I recently did a physical fitness competition, um, like on stage, just, you know, you got like six pack and everything. I was doing it with my girlfriend. <laughs> there you and, go. Nice, yeah, man. Yeah, it, it was super fun. I got in the top five, so I was excited. But, you know, I'm oh, wow. going to do 45 minutes of cardio while I'm like typing up stuff for, uh, it was actually, I was typing up questions for a podcast and I'm like thinking about this gratitude thing and I'm like, man, this sucks for 45 minutes. But then I'm like, you know what? I actually like get the ability to do this right now. And in that clarity, I was like, you know what? I have the opportunity to be the best person I can become and build whatever I want in life. And some people, unfortunately don't have that anymore. You know, when they, when we pass on, that's the only time you hit it disappears is when we move on to the next, whatever's after, you know, when you're no longer on this earth, that's the only time you don't have the opportunity. And I talked to a lot of people who have, you know, some physical limitations and they're like, as long as I'm alive, I can still do something about it. 100% man. Absolutely. I think a lot of it comes down to as well, just to tag onto that. A lot of it comes down to, um, it just comes down to taking action. I mean, the whole entrepreneurship thing isn't really something like you can read, you can read as many books as you want. You can study as much as you want. You can go to these panels and listen to Gary Vee all you want. But at the end of the day, like you have to just step up and you have to just, you have to step in the batter's box. Um, and so a lot of people, I think, you know, they, they stutter and they stumble and they, and they try and, um, you know, at least hang out in the circle and, and they, and they don't really step up to the plate, but you know, once you, once you do, um, it is all about appreciating it, like you said, and really appreciating that you have the opportunity to even be in that space, um, and really just take the risks and the chances. And, um, more than anything, it's an opportunity to grow and just, and just find what it is that you're passionate about. You know, maybe, maybe that project that you're working on isn't your thing. And you thought it was, but maybe it turns out that it isn't and that segues ways into something else. So, um, it's important to take those chances. 100%. How do you guys, um, kind of mitigate the fear of failure or risk that's, you know, every entrepreneur knows is going to happen, but how do you get over that? <sighs> that's, a, that's a good question, man. Um, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not 18 years old right now. So I'll tell you that, you know, we have to be very smart and very strategic in every email that we send, every phone call we make, um, going back to time management, it's all about, it's all about time. You know, we're not, again, we're not young, <laughs> young, young kids anymore. So we have to be really smart. And from a risk side, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's faith. I think it's, it's really knowing that there is such good momentum behind us right now. And so we kind of have to ride that tailwind as long as we can. Um, and if we do take risk, we do it, we do it all in. And we, and we try and mitigate that with, with experience and testing and trial and error. And that's kind of what we're doing right now with the, with the platform. And we just launched the beta, uh, a week ago on the 24th, April 24th. Congrats. Um, thank you, man. It's, it was a, a long time coming, but you know, that's, that's another, that this, this whole, this whole thing is, is one big pile of risk. Um, but we try and mitigate that with beta testing and working with brand partners and working with labels and collecting feedback, making changes, you know, all of this so that when we do launch, um, we try and have a, a tool that, that is seamless and is, is looks great, works great, um, is actually impactful and useful. Um, so it's, it's just being smart, man. That's yeah. all there is to it. I want to get into your guys' platform in a second, but real quick, just for people who are not in the middle of a growing business as you guys are, um, and really kind of scaling it up, you know, you've got the, you got the wins behind you, but when you first started a couple years ago, how did you make that leap? How did you take that risk on, um, you know, what did you say to yourself when you were first starting and you didn't have the momentum, you know, you started at ground zero. I think um, in certain situations, sometimes you don't really have that much to lose in the early stages because you haven't been so involved for that 
you, you haven't put in like the two years, for example, three years that we've done. So in the early stages, it's a little bit easier to say, let's give it a shot and then try to find small things along the way immediately to quantify like, okay, that was worth the time and constantly just checking in like, is it still worth putting the time? Is it still worth putting the time? And I think that that helped in the early stages. And like, you know, I think a lot of people, if they make money in the, in the beginning of a company, they um, aren't really that lean with it. And I think we've been unique with saving a lot of the money that we were making and, and using that protectively to just be able to start growing and, and having using that to support us. Right. So just, just because we did a couple of deals that were, they were pretty, pretty good. Doesn't mean that you can go out and go get that really nice office space. Right. right. So helps that you guys like to work remotely too. <laughs> yeah, it does. A lot, yeah. There's a lot of it does. It's so interesting though. Like a lot of the, a lot of company owners that we've spoken with though, um, actually, Pra- praise the the non office environment. So it was funny because John and I were considering getting an office space a while ago, and then we were just having these conversations with with business owners, and they're like, "No, don't do it. You got you have insurance. You have like blah blah blah. You have all this stuff to worry about. Um, and plus, all of our all of our team members are remote anyway. So we're like, why yeah. would we do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, it's interesting, but yeah, John's right. I mean, look, we took, we took every penny that, that we made, um, from most of the deals up until about six months ago. until we, you know, really started paying ourselves, but we were taking all that and reinvesting it back into the product, um, back into growing the team, uh, marketing, um, you have to build a brand uh, as I'm sure we'll get into. Um, so all of that was, was us, mitigating risk and, and reinvesting back into, back into the company. So just to highlight that point, sometimes people think that owning a business is you're going to pay yourself right away, but it wasn't until really six months ago that you guys started paying yourselves and you're just constantly reinvesting that money into the business. Yeah. And it shows absolutely. You guys have been growing very quickly. Um, and so I, not sure which way to tackle this first, but basically, you know, how to build a brand, how you guys have built your brand and, uh, talking about the platform. I feel like they kind of build together a little bit. So which would you like to tackle on first? Oh boy. Um, I guess, I guess we can talk about the platform that we get into, into the, the building a brand. Part. Sounds good. Yeah. So, so what is this platform? How did, how is it different than what, what's out there? And how do you guys use it? Right. So the platform is, it's a software tool that allows brands and music companies to form strategic marketing partnerships with, with music influencers. And we define a music influencer as being um, a signed recording artist or an emerging recording artist that, that we've personally cherry picked and just and decided, great, you're, you're a horse we want to bet on. So that's the, that's the, the elevator pitch to the platform. Now, what it really is, is it's, it is your typical influencer marketing platform. Um, but it it is specific to the music industry. And so when we, when we get into talking about building a brand, that was, that, that was on purpose. The reason that we stuck with the music industry, you know, we had several companies, large companies come to us and say, Hey, well, uh, we want to work with you, but you know, we want to use traditional influencers and we turn that business down because we decided it was important that we owned one share of, of the market and owned a niche um, that no one else had been tackling. So just a quick segue into building a brand, because I guess this, this was a good transition. Um, I think that's important. You know, a lot of companies, they try and throw, uh, throw their weight around in a lot of different verticals. Um, and we decided to stay, stay in, in one and it's worked to our advantage. Um, we've gotten a lot of publicity because of it. Um, and also it makes us a trusted voice from both the brand side and the music company side, music companies trust us because we're on their team. We want to make new revenue streams for their companies and their talent. Um, and we have, and then brands because the music game is confusing on so many levels for so many people, even experts, you know, it's, it's, it's a confusing nasty business it's the music industry man it's tough um what's like something that's sorry what's something that's confusing about the 
br- business branding of musicians in the music industry? Because I'm I'm not in it, and you mm-hmm. guys have been in it for years. What what's an example that you're talking about? Uh, I think I think working with talent is specific to, to us working with talent. There's a lot of unknowns, you know, is this artist willing to do this? Are they willing to do this? Um, you know, it's, it comes down to from a brand perspective when they make a phone call saying, Hey, we want to work with an artist and we have a million dollar budget. Who can you get? Traditionally they're making that phone call to an agency and they're allowing the talent agency to make the decision on, you know, these are the top five artists that we would submit for you guys to consider. Um, okay. The problem with that is that um, agencies, it's a, it's a biased thing. They're, they're not really providing, they're not giving the full scope of the talent that's available in the marketplace. And so from the brand perspective, they're really getting, they're getting uh, swindled a little bit because they're not seeing the full picture. And so gotcha. in any other marketing situation, you're able to see all the data, all the insights to really justify a decision. You know, am I going to be putting this, this commercial at this time or this time? Am I going to buy this bill, billboard or this billboard and why? Um, and the same thing should be true for music talent and influencer talent. Why am I putting money towards this artist versus this artist? What are they doing in the marketplace? What's the ROI? What are the projections? Um, what's the engagement rate? What's their brand affinity? So for all these reasons, up until now, um, brands have had to trust agents. And mm. unfortunately, it uh, doesn't really work out. <laughs> Not everybody's uh, as trustworthy. Yeah, it doesn't really out. work out a lot of the time. Um, and so, so we've, we've tried, to, uh, tried to help brands in, in, in that discovery process by providing so those insights. Yeah, and your platform basically opens it up to all available artists for them to be able to kind of pick and choose right. and, and uh, like limit based on certain search parameters, right? Who they want to get. Is that it? hundred percent. Yeah. So basically you're, it's agnostic. So we're not, we're playing, we're, we're taking a role. We're saying we don't have invested interest with any of these companies, any agency, any label. We're strictly looking at the data of what, what the results are and what the markets are or what, what these, what the talent is, would be really good at and providing those results as a service versus having, you know, you know, let's say I worked at, at a major agency. Well, I'm going to be biased to wanting to use my own roster. I just thought of a interesting question. Um, you know, somebody who's thinking about building a, a platform or an app and they have no clue how to do it. Are either one of you guys, coders oh man we <laughs> now we are no <laughs> now we are, uh, oh really have you guys taught yourselves or what no we we uh th- i think we're a great we're a great example of of uh two guys that had no clue what how to build software how to build a platform we had no idea um we just did a, a ton of research uh made a few mistakes um, but we had a, we had a great team around us to really give us support. And, you know, we, we did a lot of outreach to, to advisors and to mentors, um, to help connect the dots for us and, and provide introductions yep. to, to trusted people. Yeah. It's, yeah, we've had a lot of great, great support. You know, we've had a lot of, you know, people that are in the tech space, give us advice along the way. And we've, we've taken some to heart and some, some we've left behind, but we came to our own conclusions, you know? So you guys uh, just hired out a lot of the actual work and kind of put it together and piece it as like a team effort, or are you guys actually building the platform yourselves at some point? Well, we never, we never really coded anything. I'll tell you this. When we did start, when we, when we first had the idea, John and I sat down and we, and we just hacked a square space to be honest with you. So that was our initial MVP. Um, we, we hacked that thing until it couldn't, be hacked anymore we ran it into the ground um and then eventually we brought on uh because of that traction we brought we started to build a team and and brought on people that uh kind of shared in our 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 vision um so while we didn't actually sit there and code we certainly sat in on every meeting we we worked on the wireframes and the processes because uh it is so specific and so that's really not something you can just hand off to to ui ux designer and say great here's the idea go fix it um, go build right. it. You know, we had to really, we had to really make this a team effort. Um, cause there's a lot of variables in a, in a partnership deal. 
there's a lot of variables. And so we had to work through all that. Um, you know, especially when we're trying to build a tool that simplifies that process. The last thing we wanted to do was, was complicate it. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> <would> it be <laughs> counterproductive. <laughs> um, I, I like what you guys said though. You, you bootstrapped it in the beginning as you got some traction, then you hired on a team. Just so many people think that I don't have the resources to build what I want to build. I have no idea how to build an app, but I bet if I reached out to five or 10 people, I could find somebody who knows how to build an app and then eventually help me or give me some advice. Or nowadays, you know, you can just jump on almost any program that has like an auto build feature. Basically, you guys had the resourcefulness to get things done and get moving. And then once you started to scale, you you hired on some other people. Yeah. I think that's an important uh, takeaway. Absolutely. So it's, it's really yeah. the only way to do it. Um, yeah, there's just been so many of our of our of our colleagues. I'll say that have have thrown money at something. They're just thrown money at an idea, and you know, a couple of months later, you find out that they're no longer doing that. So they, you know, it's it's tough, man. I think you just have to really grow a business from the ground up. Um, that's that's a that's a personal thing. I suppose. A little bit more of an old, yeah, it's a little bit more of an old school approach, which is start doing business with what you got, and then move slowly so that you know. You stick, you stick, you yep. stick with it. Yeah. Because if not, then you, you have a hobby, not a business. Absolutely. And it disappears after six months. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Yep. Um, so a, a little bit more into brand building. I mean, you guys have built your brand in the music industry. You help other brands be built using music influencers. What's the process that you see it takes to really build a brand and a community? I mean, you said it right there, man. It starts with building a community. You have to, you have to build, you have to build awareness. And, you know, obviously that we can get into the micros of that, but, you know, it really comes down to having an identity that people can connect with and something that they can kind of own as their own slightly and take ownership of that brand. That's the best case scenario. And so there's a few steps you can take to get to that place. Um, and obviously we're young, we're, we're, we're definitely a small company. Um, but being, being in the music industry and being, um, really needing to be a trusted voice, that's kind of where our brand comes from. That's where it stems from is, is making sure that we're always that trusted voice. Um, we're unbiased, um, and, and we deliver. So for us, it's really hitting those three things and, and really making sure that we stay true to our mission, which is to build revenue streams for both brands and music companies. Jonathan, do you want to uh, expand on, I was just curious about the identity, like getting people to really connect and own part of the brand. I think Thomas nailed it on, on the head with that. And I think that, you know, as you, uh, there's also, there's also a, a, a person, a, a level of just, general interest in your own personality that goes into the product and that honesty that goes behind whatever you're building, what you're standing behind is if you're, if you're helping people, right? Like people will genuinely want to associate themselves with that. And if, if, and that tends to breed people wanting to subscribe or wanting to be part of the part of the platform. So just being honest I think really it's been interesting to see too, like, you know, getting into the micro elements of, of building a, a company or brand, you know, obviously there's social media, there's, there's email marketing, there's building audience funnels. There's, you know, if we're using ad roll, it's, there's, there's a lot of micro things that we do to help get our, get our name out there. But, you know, it really comes down to, um, uh, we've been writing a lot of articles on LinkedIn, which is a really powerful platform. Yeah form for, for businesses. Um, I'll say probably about 30% of our business just comes from people connecting on LinkedIn and saying, Hey, we noticed, you know, what you guys are up to. It seems really interesting. Let's, let's figure something out. Um, and those will turn into those, those have turned into, um, some very large clients of ours. So that's amazing. Cause uh -huh. you're the second person that's told me a lot about, or maybe the third person talked about LinkedIn and really stepping into that as a way to market yourself. Um, through something like an article mm -hmm. and people just kind of see it and it gains traction. You know, a lot of people are looking at Facebook ads and Instagram ads um, or, you know, pay-per-clicks. And it could be as simple as 
just writing an article and connecting with the people you have on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And apparently that's 30% of your business, which that's, I mean, that's incredible. Um, and something that I, I like that as an action item to write a few blogs and post to your LinkedIn group. Um, it just to gain some traction and build awareness. Absolutely. And it comes back to being that trusted voice. You know, if our product isn't, it's not consumer facing. So, you know, running Facebook ads or running some, some cool short form video on Instagram, probably won't connect with the people that we need to connect with, at least on that trusted level. Uh, that's certainly a, a way to go about it. We definitely do that. It's, it's a first and second touch for us, but, you know, really to have that, that trusted voice, whether that comes through an email or if that comes through LinkedIn, um, that goes back to building a brand and really, and really providing something useful that people, uh, need right now, uh, clearly. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, honesty is such a huge thing and something that um, transparency is this huge problem that, you know, is really being unveiled with the Internet and, you know, a lot of these corporate uh, companies where you're just like, oh, my God, like, I can't believe that's been this problem. Um, And we're seeing it just in every industry of life um, as people are becoming more transparent and the consumer and the community and the people around it want that. Absolutely. I mean, there's been so many years of, of people having to trust somebody just because they were the closest business to them or that, you know, so I think it's in a really exciting time. And, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think to just touch back on what you're saying, as far as the LinkedIn stuff, you know, one of the things, you know, a lot of people might go ahead and say, okay, great. Well, now I'm going to go write articles, but what are you providing somebody with? Like, if you're going to write something, just actually have a unique, perspective that's providing value that's helpful and interesting it's not just write something or connect with somebody on linkedin just because it's going to grow your network it's provide something of value and a reason which is what thomas is saying is become that trusted voice because you are you you're knowledgeable in the space right like right so not just any article what value are you providing for someone else yeah and exactly. that comes up too with like a transaction type of stuff where people sometimes try to provide value in, in air quotes there that it in return gets something back from them. Have you ever been to a networking event and somebody's like, right. yeah, I want to ask you these three highly specific questions just so I can then introduce myself and sell you on a product. Uh, and here's my business card. And it's like, yeah. Hey man, I, no, I'm just, here to network. Like I don't want to be sold your product. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, Really true. I think I, I was, I think I was going to post something the other day that was like, you know, what is, what is your opinion on, on, uh, outreach through LinkedIn where you get hit with an, like a message and it just says, you know, Hey, how can I provide value to you? It's, it's when you say it so bluntly like that as a, as a entrepreneur, or if you're doing outreach as a, you know, for sales or something like that, when you, when you approach someone that bluntly, it really almost has the reverse effect of being helpful. It, you already know what's coming. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's really being, I guess, clever with your tactics there, but I, I get that a lot yeah. too. I mean, surprisingly <laughs> a lot where, wow, I really like what you're doing, Corey. How can I be of service to you? <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. Why don't you, you want to use your brain and just figure yeah. it out? Yeah. Like I, I'm <laughs> so confused, man. Sometimes, you know, it's yeah. like, did you just see somebody say this and then like <laughs> they got results and you want to do it now? What? <laughs> where did that motivation come? Because like, I really do want to provide value. And I, I've said this a few times recently. Um, cause I was just remembering about it when, when I bought my beach house, uh, I was sitting up at the top of the deck. I tried connecting with everybody in my family and my girlfriend and I called everybody, nobody answered. And I was like, man, I got this, like, um, I just got the keys to the house. I'm so excited, but I'm all alone. And I just want to share it with people. Yep. And so for me, I found in multiple experiences through life that if I only do it for myself, I'm just kind of lacking in fulfillment and it doesn't make me feel good. You know, it's like you, you get the opposite. And what I found is that the end goal, I just want to share with people. So when I'm talking about adding value, I'm like, Hey guys, like I'm racing to the top of the mountain, but I want everybody to come with me Mm -hmm. because I don't want to be the only guy up there. That doesn't sound fun. I mean, look, that's, that's the right way to approach it. 100%. I mean, that's, that is that's happiness right there, man. You, you just described it. That's, that's, that's really knowing yourself and knowing what makes you happy. And, um, I think that's missing with a lot of people that, that understanding that, 
you know, it is a team effort. You didn't get to where you are by yourself, just sitting in a room and, and huddled up. You know, there's, there's people help you along the way, whether you know it or not. So it's acknowledging that and being humble to accept that. Absolutely. Um, so kind of to finish up this interview, guys, I've had a really uh, enjoyable time talking with you and learning about the music industry and building brands. Likewise. Um, I'd love to see, like, what would you say if I'm starting a business right now, what would be one to two actions I should take to really start to grow my brand? We talked about the LinkedIn articles, but what would be something I could do um, to really get engaged in the community to help build a brand? Oh man, Facebook marketing. If you want to get tactical with it, you got to build, you have to really build out your audiences. Um, you have to really be smart on the technical side, build out those Facebook pixels. That's really the simplest, most straightforward way to, to really have a, an immediate impact. Um, and then to just create that engagement. Now you're creating remarketing, retargeting content. Um, the cost of entry is so, it's so cheap now. And it's, and it's, it's, it's such a powerful tool that 10, 20 years ago, people didn't even have that. So it's, it's, so it's just so easy to reach a lot of people on Facebook. Um, and what would you, how would I learn about just doing Facebook ads? Like how'd you guys, when you started, you know, learn about Facebook ads, you just start a Facebook page and, and read some articles or what did you do? You know, I think it's also, it's, it's, it's Facebook, but it's, it's also, uh, it's, it's Facebook and email tactics. And really it comes down to content, um, and, and building out a remarketing and retargeting strategy. You have to be really smart with your audiences. You have to segment them. Um, you have to utilize Facebook pixels. Uh, so it, there's a lot that goes into it, but again, it just comes down to, it comes down to having a real, uh, manifesto for your company and knowing who you are and staying true to that. That's going to be getting back to that identity. Absolutely. Right. And, and okay. All right. Yeah. No, I'm just thinking about it. I, I, it's been a while since I've run Facebook ads and I saw some decent success with it, but I was really just trying like the boost, the post. Mm-hmm. Um, I did some for another company I was with and that actually worked pretty well, but it was a highly targeted audience. We were very clear on exactly who we wanted to be between age range and geographics mm-hmm. and, and demo, all the demographics, just everything. Um, and I think that clarity really helped us maximize results. Um, very cool. So where can we find you guys online and connect with you? Oh man, LinkedIn. <laughs> there <laughs> right? we go. Yeah. LinkedIn. Uh, we're, we're, we're always on LinkedIn. Um, email is uh, Thomas at Partnerly and Jonathan at Partnerly. Um, of course, uh, partner.ly is our website. Um, we're on all the social channels as well. But, you know, really feel free to, to send us an email. We respond immediately. Um, that's another thing about us is that, you know, we don't wait, we don't wait several days to respond. I think being a young company, you have to be quick and you have to be willing to, to engage with people. So that's what we're all about. Awesome. And that's another thing too, just as a final touch, I've noticed throughout this entire interview is speed, not just efficiency, but speed as well. If you're going to do something, do it fast and, and get things done. Um, and just the fast, you guys have really stayed true to that. And, uh, I can hear it in all the answers and I appreciate it. I'm, I'm doing that myself. Speed. <laughs> cool, man. You're killing it. We love this. We love this. It was a great, great interview. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So our final question we always end with, and I'll have you guys each answer one at a time. Um, or you can try to do it at the same time. That'll be fun. Just kidding. <laughs> we, prob- we probably could by now. <laughs> I want you to finish sure. each other's sentences. <laughs> uh, so you guys have been really successful, but what is your next level of success? Um, a little bit more free time. How about that? Hey, nice. I like it. Okay. <laughs> do you want to know something creepy? I swear to God, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> we've had a, we've had a, we've had a couple of those moments. That's what. That's how you know you found someone that you got to work with, right? It's like okay, we're on the same page. Just a little bit, not too much more. Just a little bit. <laughs> just to enjoy the finer things in life, huh? Yeah. But you know, that's that's what we signed up for. We knew we knew it was the long game, so we're happy with it. But I think I think some more some more time to go grab a beer and hang out at the beach would be would be uh, well deserved. Absolutely. Well, guys, thanks so much for coming on Unleash Success. Right on. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. 
If you guys enjoyed the show and learned something of value, the one ask that we have is please go subscribe. If you'd like to leave us a five-star rating and review, that definitely helps us get our message out there. Because each week, I'm going to interview amazing people. And I want to be able to give you more and more tools and strategies that get you real results. Feel free to connect with me on Facebook or Instagram at Corey Corpodian, or just visit the website at UnleashSuccess.com. Remember, knowing is not enough. Knowledge alone is not power. Action is. Because action is the only way to get the results you want in life and truly live the life of your dreams. So go take some action. Subscribe to the podcast and get ready to unleash success in you.